The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Would it alter your view of the Great Lakes to think of the water as alive? Tonight, as we continue our partnership with the Council of the Great Lakes Region during the Great Lakes Public Forum, we'll learn about that and why indigenous knowledge could transform our connection to these waters. Also, we'll hear from a world-renowned cave diver about exploring what might be dubbed the sixth Great Lake and find out why so-called forever chemicals still haunt this essential watershed. It's Tuesday, September 27th, and that's next on The Agenda. Indigenous knowledge of the Great Lakes may be vast and long-standing, but so far it hasn't been at the forefront of policymaking. And for that matter, it may not be widely understood, both in approach and substance. With us to help explain why a new appreciation of that expertise is long overdue, we're joined from Treaty 6 Territories in Saskatchewan by Tasha Beads, Water Walker and Visiting Professor at the Indigenous Legal Orders Institute at the University of Windsor's Faculty of Law. In Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Don Martin Hill, professor in Indigenous Studies at Hamilton's McMaster University. And in Montreal, Quebec, George Kennedy, faculty lecturer at McGill's School of Continuing Studies. And we're delighted to have the three of you on our program tonight to shed some light on something that I think we all need a lot more knowledge about. So, Don, why don't we start with you? Let's start with this phrase, Indigenous Ways of Knowing. What is the sort of intent behind that phrase? So Indigenous people have their own epistemologies and uh, pedagogies, methodologies that have been accumulated for thousands of years based on their observations of the world around them, as well as keeping that informationalized stories through transmission, through ceremony. So it is a way of being. It's not a religion, nor is it just an education academic exercise. It's literally who they are as human beings and the knowledge they possess um, is often been transmitted uh, from a very long time. And we need access to that information because of the current situation we're in with climate change. Well, that's Tasha, that was gonna be my follow-up, which is to say, do you think it's adequately respected in non-Indigenous circles? Um, I do believe that there is a shift occurring in the broader consciousness of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people um, within the context of Turtle Island or North America, as you know it. But I, I, I do believe that there needs to be more, more education, more awareness, and more understanding of how we as Indigenous peoples conceptualize the water. Um, of course, for us, the water, like the earth, are living entities. And and so when you begin to see the water as living, it creates a different frame of reference in your mind. And, and I think that the education and the activism of Indigenous people, uh, particularly the grassroots people, has created that, has begun to create that shift in consciousness. George, let me get you to follow up on that as well. Do you think the non-Indigenous world respects that information, those traditions, as much as they ought to? Well, I believe there's a, a trend nowadays, uh, like like was mentioned earlier, uh, with um, with the with the social movements of uh, indigenous peoples across not only uh, uh, North and South America, but uh, throughout the world as uh, indigenous peoples, they they hold that knowledge, and uh, I believe with the with the trend of uh, academic in institutions um, developing uh, STEM programs. Um, I think it is also reinforcing and uh, creating a momentum uh, with uh, more grassroots people um, picking up that torch. Um, but in in my language, we call it uh, Jeep Neon Gualihodo, which means our ways. And as uh, Don had mentioned, um, that uh, you know it's a way of life. It's it's not a religion, um, and and that's how we uh, that's how we move forward in our understanding standing in this in this lifetime what language was that that you just spoke that was uh oneida oneida gotcha okay um, united nation understood 
Uh, the momentum that you just referred to. Don, do you see that momentum in your daily activities? There is a shift. I think the, um, the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, study of the world's ecosystem in 2018 and 2022 found um, you know, that indigenous people hold 84% of the world's biodiversity in their hands. Um, I think that was a shock to scientists. It was a shock to uh, governments. Um, and then in 2022, they found uh, where indigenous people receive no funds for conservation of their ecosystems, they're doing uh, at par or better than uh, well-funded organizations. So I think at COP26, they realized they needed to invest heavily in understanding what is indigenous knowledge, um, how can it uh, mitigate climate change and begin to conserve the biodiversity that we're currently losing at alarming rates. So I think the science spoke and now people are listening, but it's, we've been saying this all along, elders have been going to the UN in the nineties, begging them to listen to what they had to say and to to stop doing what they were doing, particularly to water. And, and um, it fell on deaf ears, unfortunately. It, it, it but fell on deaf ears in the past. What, what did, was there a specific thing that happened at a specific time that you think got people to sort of perk up and r realize that they maybe ought to start paying a little more attention to this? Well, I do think it's the trickle down effect of that study of the intergovernmental panel. There was a, a, you know, dozens and dozens of countries data that was uh, weighted through by you know dozens of scientists globally. So this this I think you know became uh, aware uh, to governments at the various sustainable development movement that they have at the UN um, carbon footprint. So every time they have these events, this issue is brought up. Well, indigenous people are the ones who are managing their environments, particularly their water. It, if they control and manage it. So that's the big difference. Six Nations does not control the Grand River. Um, but if we did, it would be in a much better, healthier state than it currently is. So, so governance becomes critical to this discussion. We'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, Tasha, maybe you could uh, help us with a bit of a list here because, of course, um, across Turtle Island or North America, there are uh, thousands thousands of First Nations, but which are the ones that have been most significantly attached to the Great Lakes, in your view? In my view, it would be, of course, the Anishinaabe, uh, but also the Haudenosaunee, and historically the Wendat. And of course, now we've got many visiting uh, Indigenous nations, but the the knowledge that I've been kind of trained in is specifically that from the Anishinaabe worldview. And so the Great Lakes have been um, have been considered pivotal to Anishinaabe culture, history, and traditions. In fact, um, there's very much a relationship that was entered into in, in, in our in the Anishinaabe stories. It goes back to the time of creation, and so um, you know that's very very old knowledge, and the relationship is still a, a living relationship. Um, the Anishinaabe of 2022 still carry those understandings and responsibilities on, on how to care for the water um, and, and in fact have um, have played significant roles in continuing to protect the water. And I think in this instance, of course, of the Saugeen First Nation who um, created a, at one point they wanted to bury a nuclear uh, waste in along shore, along the shorelines of the of the Great Lakes and it was the Saugeen First Nation who um, un unanimously voted no and so with that power that uh, Professor Martin Hill was talking about you know that power of agency and sovereignty um, they were able to say no to that that uh, uh, nuclear deposit. And so, I mean, I, I think that sense of care and sense of responsibility um, that Indigenous nations all along the Great, Sh Great Lakes have, have um, 
it's continued. Of course, that's a place of sustenance. You know, fishing was was pivotal in the past and still very much is. It was a, a mode of transportation in terms of the, the canoes. Of course, all the Great Lakes are connected. Um, people don't realize that, but whatever happens to one happens to all of the others too. Oh, if so. they read Paddle to the Sea when they were kids, they know that they're all connected. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. George, maybe I could get you to pick up the story. How would you say historical events or legislation that various Canadian governments have passed has affected the relationship that Indigenous communities have with the Great Lakes? Well, uh, I guess speaking to, um, I guess, one treaty that is uh, known as the, the Nanfan Treaty, and this is going way back to uh, pre-Confederation, pre of uh, 17, 1701, um, then with, um, well, there was two treaties, uh, 17, well, the 1701 uh, Great Peace of Montreal, as well as uh, the Nanfan Treaty of that same year, where the uh, Haudenosaunee uh, Lodianesso, or uh, Confederacy, or uh, Men with a Good Mind, they um, had diplomats uh, go to, to negotiate a, a treaty respecting um, I guess the shared responsibility with the Western nations, uh, going back to that far. So we all have that uh, responsibility as uh, the original peoples of of this uh, of the Great Lakes Basin, uh, which covers uh, you know all throughout that invisible border of uh, you know of that international border that doesn't that, that actually does not um, we are not uh, that's an invisible border that's o that's over our heads. Um, from from other uh, uh, treaties, so our our treat our treaties are are part of our legislation, which uh, that is uh, ingrained in um, our rights uh, to the land. And most recently, uh, the Attorney General um, of Ontario recognized that Nanfan Treaty when it came to to uh, hunting rates um, around the Hamilton area. Actually, you found that to be a positive development, I guess. Yes. Okay. So these uh, these ancient treaties are, you know, being honored, and they really need to be uh, revisited in terms of our, you know, our relationship with the crown as allies. Okay, Don, uh, you mentioned Six Nations a few moments ago, so let me circle back to that. I take it you are Mohawk and live in Six Nations territory. Is that right? Okay, which you know, for those who don't know is near Brantford, Ontario. What's, uh, how would you describe or how would you characterize uh, your people's relationship to the Great Lakes? Well, I just uh, uh, interviewed uh, one of the uh, traditional leaders, um, Jock, uh, who's a knowledge holder and asked him about um, different things. And he was explaining how the Great Lakes was made uh, during the time of creation, um, which is our story of the of the twins, and how um, the creator, in order to give humans uh, drinking water, because there was ocean water here, according to our creation story, um, he dragged his fingers along the Great Lakes um, so that the water would be there, as well as put water underneath, which is really medicine. So our aquifers um, are precious and, and sacred to us. And in fact, the words in Mohawk for uh, things like rain or water, it, it's 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 about being precious. It's it's things that like Oneganos, our our research project. It's it's cherished. These are things you hold as the sustenance of life and to take care of it with great care. So I think Six Nations has been really um, battling uh, Nestle and um, now Blue Triton from draining our aquifer while many of us um, go without uh, access to clean drinking water because we don't get the funding that the federal government gave other communities um, to get access to clean water. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have waste treatment plants. We don't have operating money. So our people pay for water to be trucked in. They pay for the septic to be removed. And 
you know, you can be upwards of 400 a month um, just to have access to things Canadians enjoy. So I think Six Nations is doing all that it can to try to provide services, but, you know, our source water, the Grand River, is, you know, um, contaminated. We have 25 different uh, waste treatment plants upstream from us. We have Uniroyal who was dumping, you know, um, PCBs and carcinogens. So there's a lot to clean up in that water, but we're in the same situation that many Canadians are going to find themselves in if they don't make different policies and water laws, which I hope Canada does because their water laws are over almost 60 years old and don't even include Indigenous people. So I'm glad that they're recognizing treaties because if we get our treaties recognize we will start improving our ecosystems. Um, that's a proven fact. Well, that is certainly why we've invited the three of you to come on our airwaves tonight and share your wisdom on these issues. And, and Tasha, maybe, uh, maybe you could help us with this. I introduced you at the beginning of our conversation as a water walker. And I'm not sure everybody knows what that means. So why don't you tell us what that means to be a water walker? All right. Well, the water walk movement is actually, um, it began in 2003 with an Anishinaabe grandmother, a late Anishinaabe grandmother. She's since passed away by the name of Josephine uh, Baum and Dahlman. And we put the BA at the end of her name to recognize her as, as having passed on. But in 2003, she and a number of other grandmothers um, were following uh, a call out by the three fires, Medewin chief, uh, Eddie Benton Benai, but as well, he's passed on. And at that time, the elders were talking about a prophecy wherein water would eventually be worth more than her weight in gold. And at that time, they asked, what are you going to do about it? So Josephine Ba and a number of other grandmothers decided to take one of the Medewin water ceremonies out into the public eye, and they wanted to activate and move for, um, for the Great Lakes. And so she began walking. So essentially, the water walk is a ceremony um, where we take um, some of the, the source or the headwater in a copper vessel. You can see one behind me there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we carry that. Uh, we kind of orphan the water from its original source. And then we walk along as close to the water's edge as possible. And so the water walk movement um, is about First and foremost, it's a ceremony. It's to recognize that water is life. And while we're walking, we're praying and we're singing and we're speaking in in, in the language, um, you know, acknowledging the life that the water carries for us, but also looking ahead um, seven generations. And while it's, it's also more than a ceremony because people, uh, the way I conceptualize it, we become visual, walking prayers and so we're we're a physical representation um of of our inherent right to access to that water and in our inherent right to have ceremony for that water and so josephine ba by the end of her you know she walked for almost 20 years um and she accumulated almost thirty thousand kilometers um i myself have walked for the water for 11 years so i walked in 2015 um, we went from matan quebec to duluth in 2017, we went back and it's a very different, um, you know, you see the world differently when you're walking alongside um, the water or on the earth herself versus, you know, speeding in a in a train or a vehicle. And so you, you get to bear witness. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I've walked for, like I said, 11 years, almost 8,000 kilometers, a small, uh, small limit compared to a small amount compared to Josephine Ba. But in those 11 years, you know, one of the most striking um, elements that I think we as water walkers have borne witness to is the amount of garbage, the amount of waste. Um, you know, I think of Junction Creek. I did a water walk for Junction Creek uh, in 2021. And Junction Creek actually empties into uh, Lake Huron. And so the amount of garbage, it's it 
you know, at, at one point I was at the shoreline in tears because I don't think people realize that all of that garbage eventually finds its way into the Great Lakes. And as we've established, they're all connected. As of today, 22 million pounds of plastic enter the Great Lakes. Um, and, and I mean, it sounds tremendous um but it's actually very frightening because that plastic breaks down into something called microplastics mm -hmm. and microplastics are these teeny tiny minuscule amounts of and they don't disappear and so as a result they enter into that life cycle and in fact um you know one of the things that scientists have discovered is that as humans, we are now seeing children born with these micro microplastics in, in their bloodstream, and we as adults have them as well. So the water walk, um, as we move, we are gathering knowledge. We are gathering knowledge from those who live alongside the shore. We're gathering knowledge from the water herself. Um, and we interact. Uh, many non-Indigenous people, we carry a eagle water staff and this copper pail. And so when you're walking, people come up and what are you doing? And so it becomes a, a method of education too. And so, you know, we can engage the farmers or, or people just wondering, you know, what exactly are you doing? So it becomes a platform for education too. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all about activating for different bodies of water. Um, and so it is a ceremony and anyone can join us. So that's that's another element that's educational for particularly for non-Indigenous people, but also for those who may have been divorced from their Indigenous knowledges through colonial practices. Uh, anyone can walk for the water. And so we often have people come out. Um, you know, I think about uh, the Kortha Lakes, my teachers, Liz Oswamek and Shirley Williams, they have done walks there for seven years. And when we first started, there was maybe, you know, they had maybe 10 women. By the end of those seven years, we had 300 people walking with us. And so it really is a movement that everyone can can take part of. If they want to um, take part in it, if they want to find out when the next walk is happening, how do they do that? Um, we do have a social media site um, that I'm going to be rolling out really shortly. It's called, uh, you can find it under www.waterwalkers.ca. Um, it's a website that I've created to help promote the water and promote my work with the water. And so there is um, a, a list of upcoming water walks on that website. Great. We'll have a look at that. Thank you for that. George, your teachings have been passed down over the years. Uh, generation to generation to generation to generation and on and on. Um, for those who don't know, how far back do you think these oral histories go? Well, since since creation, um, you know, uh, as was mentioned before, you know, I think that the word, uh, well, the uh, at the time of uh, creation is is when kind of the natural law was was uh, outlined and our responsibilities were were outlined to us, you know, with the initially with our four basic ceremonies. Uh, well, they're not really basic, but uh, fundamental. Um, so that's how we carry ourselves as, uh, you know, as Ongwehongwe or Anishinaabe is through those original teachings. And they go, they go back, you know, um, you know, at least, uh, at least a couple thousand, maybe even like 3000 years ago, like in terms of the North, the northeastern when you know um you know it goes the it, it goes back uh, some some say since time immemorial so okay don maybe i could follow up with you on that what do you think indigenous knowledge and history bring to our understanding of water and nature um i think that uh canadians north americans uh the settler society um who've been here you know maybe 400 years, need to listen to the people that have been here um, since millennia. And, you know, it's about the teachings of this land and, and what our people have accumulated. It's the domain of women. Women have uh, carry water with, with children. We understand in our teachings, you know, when Sky Woman came here, she was carrying 
uh, uh, children. So water is um, a being. It is. It has a spirit. You have a relationship with it. And these teachings go back um, time immemorial. Um, we, we to date one of the newer uh, Great Law of Peace. We're looking at 1198. To date our knowledge of water. We're looking at our Ganyo Hanyo, which our children say every single day in school. Um, we say it in meetings and ceremony. It's a, it's something we say. We give thanks to water. I think if Canadians practiced that mindfulness and, and, and thankfulness and understanding that we need laws to protect our water. We need to not export our water to multinational companies that, that this is the sustenance of life. I think the values is what we offer not only Canadians or Americans, but the world needs to begin understanding indigenous ways of knowing and being, and then apply laws to steward those resources that are really gifts, according to our teachings for humans. Um, animals will survive without us. The, everything will survive without humans. We need everything to survive. So we're kind of the, the, the opposite of the man on top of the human chain. We look at it as we're children and we are dependent on, on everything our mother, the earth gives us. And I think that's what we hope Canadians will begin to appreciate and I really do think young people are um, because they've been exposed to indigenous ways of knowing a little bit more. I, I'm hoping that there's a shift in values and that money isn't always the answer to happiness because you if you don't have water it doesn't matter how much money you have you can't drink or eat money you can't drink or eat oil. Let me ask so you a quick follow-up on that. Uh, yeah, and let me ask yeah. you a quick follow-up on this, uh, that issue of values. If you've been here for 400 years and you don't listen to people who've been here for 3,000 years, what value do you think that demonstrates? Well, I think I think that you know they they brought values from from their home countries, which were very oppressive, and and I think that you know children change, generations change, and I think that that my hope is in the young people that I see a very major shift in young scientists, the team that I work with, they're really beginning to understand they got things wrong. And now they're they're looking at the disasters happening, whether it's in, you know, out east or it's happening, you know, to people in the north. You're having uh, major human consequences for for not taking care of this environment as our people pleaded for generations to please consider the future uh, of of children. And and that's what we hope. Uh, the Great Lakes is there for all of us to enjoy. Um, for the future. And I think it's a good story in a sense that the Great Lakes exist and we're we're at least trying to clean it up. We just need more more people to care deeply about our, our water. Um, well, let me get I George to follow up on that because we've got just a couple of minutes left here. And you know, Tasha gave us a, an example a few minutes ago about waterwalker.ca, how people can participate in that. Uh, George, maybe you can give us some other ideas about how people in their daily lives could demonstrate an added awareness, understanding, respect for, care for the Great Lakes that we also depend on. How could they do it? Well, I just, I, I find that um, I'm originally, well, resided in, in, in southwestern Ontario, uh, just outside of London. And, um, you know, there's um, even our community, um, you know, faces uh, contaminants coming down the Thames River. And also, we also have the challenge of uh, the Toronto, um, the Toronto garbage coming just uh, on our doorstep, basically. Uh, but we do have our water checked uh, all the time, and you know, like it seems like when there are things that are not wanted, they're like this whole thing. I know I'm kind of going a little bit north from the Great Lakes, but uh, Kirkland Lake was was uh, battling that. The nuclear waste, so all of the, all of the um, contaminants, uh, you know, that are, they're being sought next to First Nations that may not have, um, you know, um, the power to 
to uh, to stop these the movements. So I think allyship is something that we really need to to um, encourage um, because of, uh, because of colonization, um, uh, some communities uh, may not uh, may not value uh, that allyship that that can be created. But I really think that uh, what really can happen, not only just uh, uh, one of the things I'd, I've heard scientists be mentioned quite a bit, and uh, when I was uh, out, out out west um, uh, with the with the, uh, I visited the Squamish uh, territory, and uh, Ruben George uh, partnered had got allies with I can't remember which institution, but they provided the science. Uh, which stated that uh, there, there, there is going to be an oil spill. It's just a matter of when. So um, there are a number of ways. Uh, local MP is the way you know citizens can can uh, you know preserve because we're all in this together. You know, it's it's not just First Nations that are going to be affected, as uh, you know, Dr. Don Hill had mentioned as well. You know, this is uh, this is a human. This is a human fight, you know, for our existence. And if we don't adhere to, you know, to helping each other out, we're we're all in the same boat. It's just a matter of time. Tasha, let me give you the last word. We've got a minute left to go. Uh, how about all of us pitching in? What can we do? Well, I think on a basic level, again, educate yourself, educate your children, you know, think about the water as a precious commodity, you know, get rid of your lawns, think about how you're using water, um, you know, uh, have shorter showers, uh, take care of, of um, the water that exists now, cut back on, on your use of plastics. That's probably something everybody can do. And as consumers, we also have power, right? I mean, you can, if we stop purchasing plastic, all of us, then there's the demand is going to lessen. And so we can have that individual um, autonomy within our households that can trickle out at the into the broader pol political um, realm and the national realm. But I think for me, one of the most pressing ones is to teach your children to enter into a relationship with the water. If you conceptualize the water as a living entity, you're going to look at the water very, very differently. Um, again, in Anishinaabek and other Indigenous traditions, we conceptualize the water as feminine. So what I challenge students and other people to do um, is, you know, think about that water as, as your aunt or your sister, or your grandmother. Would you go and dump a bunch of garbage in your grandmother's lap or would you spill oil all over her would you um you know would you throw out your 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 uh, waste in on top of your grandmother your auntie uh, but we, we see that along the shoreline of the Great Lakes. You know, take take a bag, get your school involved, get your children involved, go for a walk, take a garbage bag with you, um, pick up the garbage safely, of course. Um, and then I, again, educate, just Google, how can I reduce my use of, of plastic, right? How can I contribute to keeping the water um, safe? How can I reduce my water consumption? Uh, one of the largest, uh, things that we saw, particularly on the Saskatchewan River water walk, was the drought. Um, there was so little water available. And, you know, and, and most people don't respond until it gets, it, until it impacts them directly. And one of the messages is from, from the water is that you need to respond now because it will impact each and every one of us. For me, I can say my, my grandchildren will know that I used my body to activate for the water, to try to raise consciousness about the need to protect what little water we have left. Some great Thank advice you. there. Thank you so much to Tasha Beads, Don Martin Hill, George Kennedy for joining us on TVO tonight. We're truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Beneath the surface of each of the Great Lakes lay mysteries and marvels of all kinds, but a particularly tantalizing one might just be a sixth Great Lake. Jill Heinerth is a world-renowned cave diver, explorer, and author of Into the Planet, One Woman's Journey to Find Herself, and she joins us now from the Great Lakes Public Forum underway in Niagara Falls, Ontario, to explain. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. Now, Jill, your job takes place in the fascinating underwater world that most of us don't get to experience. And it's not just for recreational purposes. This is your job. What is it like to do cave diving as a profession? Mm -hmm. Well, I like to tell people that I'm literally swimming through the veins of Mother Earth. So I'm in these water-filled passages beneath your feet. And I know that terrifies most people, but it's a remarkable environment, like a museum of natural history. Very nice. Now, last night, we spoke to the filmmakers about the documentary Great Lakes Untamed, and you were part of that project. Here is a clip of you diving into the Ottawa River. I'm eternally curious, but I want uh, my efforts and the risks that I take underwater um, to have value, value for society, value for scientists. So, of course, that was the Ottawa River. Many consider the sixth Great Lake. What exactly were you looking for and what did you find? Well, um, in the Ottawa River, we have Canada's longest underwater cave system with over 10.6 kilometers of passageways that go underneath Ontario and Quebec. And inside there is um, the densest population of, of life I have ever seen in a freshwater cave. So there's some remarkable mussels, these filter feeding organisms that are endangered and really important for us to, to learn about because of the service that they provide to the ecosystem. You talk about uh, those muscles. Why is it important when we talk about, uh, you know, filtering water and sort of the health of our Great Lakes and, and other waterways? Mm -hmm. Well, a muscle, a native muscle, will filter like one to two liters per hour for its entire life. And some muscles can live one to 200 years. So you can imagine how important that filtration service is because they can be, you know, filtering out things like E. coli or even flame retardants, things that we don't want in our water. And in the Ottawa River, I'm working in a place that will serve the, you know, the St. Lawrence River and all the way out to the ocean. And we just have to remember that all of these systems are connected. And what we do on the surface of the earth over here may be returned to us to drink over there. So it's all interconnected. Now, you've dived inside icebergs, active volcanoes, and even under the Sahara Desert. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people don't have this appreciation or understanding of how important the Great Lakes are. And I want to get a better saying, you've said that it's been incredibly special to be part of this particular project. How so? Oh, it's really important to me. I grew up in the Great Lakes. I learned to dive in the Great Lakes. And when I was a child, um, things were different. I mean, I used to sneak through a fence in order to access the beach and the water in Lake Ontario, a fence that said no trespassing, that was, you know, blocking access to a shared resource. And, and when I walked on the beach as a child, it was covered in drying um, dead fish. I mean, so things are better now than they were when I was a child, but we still have a long way to go. And that's going to come through making like personal connections with the water like I have. Like when we love it, we want to protect it. Tell us about that. What What is it that uh, Canadians can do um, in order to connect with the waterways and the Great Lakes and, and ultimately for the mm -hmm. health of the lakes itself? Well, you don't have to be a diver, but if you are, there's over 30,000 shipwrecks that have gone missing in the Great Lakes. We, we know of the location of, of literally thousands of shipwrecks that people can dive on and see a little bit of, of our, our historic past. Um, but there's also great abundance in, in biological species to observe underwater. And if you're not a diver, you can snorkel, swim, paddle, and do anything to, to enjoy the water, even if it's just strolling along the waterfront and enjoying the view. Um, it is the essence of life. And, and when we spend time near, on, or under the water, it definitely relaxes the soul. It's, uh, it's a really good antidote to stress. What do you hope in terms of some of the personal discoveries that you're making and your team is making? What do you hope Canadians take away um, from the discoveries in our lakes and rivers? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I do have to take risks, significant risks to do the kind of work that I do, uh, but it has to be worth it for me. It's important for me to come back with images, video, you know, educational material that I can share with others so, so that they can also understand and get connected to these important resources. And I think if there was one message that I wanted to leave with people, it's like, you know, we've all experienced COVID over the last couple of years, and that has give us, given us an idea about how humanity is all interconnected. I mean, I could hold all the COVID virus in my hand, right? And yet it's affected everybody on the planet. Well, we need to understand that the same is true for water, you know, even if you live in, you know, the middle of Ontario, and you're far from a shoreline of the Great Lakes, you know, what you do on the surface of the land still affects the watershed, it soaks into the ground, it can be transmitted through groundwater systems like the ones that I swim through. So it's those interconnections that I think are so important for us to embrace. I, I am really curious, you know, you talk about, you know, the risks that you have to take. Is it worth it uh, to, to go into these underwater caves? I, I, I want to sort of pick your brain. What's some of the most memorable caves that you have gone into personally? Like, I'm thinking when you close your eyes, you probably still, some, still see some of these visions and, and sort of pathways that you are sort of diving and navigating in. What's one of the most memorable ones you have? I mean, some places that I dive, some underwater cave systems are like literally like crystal palaces. They're so stunningly beautiful with clear water. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that the Ottawa River caves are not that. I mean, there is no delicate speleothems and formations that are that are beautiful. In fact, the water is dark red, stained by by the trees, basically by tannins. It's like tea, you know. The water's fast. There's a lot of silt, and it's difficult. And and so it's not going to attract many, if any, cave divers, certainly no one who's looking for something quote unquote beautiful. But to me, the life within that cave is beautiful to see literally at times like a hundred um, filter feeding mussels in a square meter doing their job, you know, keeping our river and the watershed clean. Um, that's beautiful to me. So we talk about the, the, the beautiful side of it all, but of course there are some, some dangers, some obvious dangers, of course. Um, you talk mm -hmm. about it as being a, a very dangerous sport. You've mentioned that you've lost over 100 friends and colleagues um, from accidents in underwater caves. What keeps you going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no question that, that cave diving is incredibly dangerous and it should be reserved only for people with the right equipment, training and background. Um, it's, it's, I would never, ever encourage anyone to, uh, to cave dive unless, you know, they take that, that level of dedication. But, um, but, you know, when you do have the training and the equipment and, and are on a meaningful mission like this, it's incredibly rewarding um, to, you know, share images from places that nobody else will ever see. Like I've literally had the chance to go where no one's gone before and bring back those images. And that's, that's really rewarding for me. Something that I've read that you've said is that, um, you know, fear keeps you safe. Can you walk us through that a little bit when you're underwater? What does that actually mean? Well, you know, people just assume that I'm fearless because I go into these places where my friends have gone to die, literally, you know, but, um, but I believe that fear guides the way for us, you know, when we are willing to step into the darkness and let our eyes adjust to the light, then that gives us an opportunity to stand on the threshold of discovery to do something that's new for us or maybe new for humanity. So I am not fearless. I'm scared every time I go diving and I want to dive with people that are afraid. So, you know, we look to the populace right now, people are afraid of a lot of things. They're afraid of the big issues that we face and water issues and climate change and everything else. But I say, embrace the fear, step into it and um, push yourself into that uncomfortable <laughs> place where you have an opportunity for discovery, you have an opportunity to be an explorer. You talk about issues, something that uh, you've sort of experienced in your 30 year career is that, uh, you know, cave diving, there aren't a lot of women in this industry, it is a highly male dominated profession. How has that affected your career? 
Well, it hasn't always been easy. I mean, certainly as a little girl, when I envisioned this career, there was there was no one that looked like me that I could look up to. Um, there are more and more women getting into technical diving, cave diving, cinematography, underwater, and that's really exciting for me to see. Um, but yeah, it was tough. I mean, I faced both you know, unintentional sexism, but as well as, as you know, quite overt um, sexism. So um, it's it's been a struggle at times, a struggle to create an independent career in, in, in uh, a profession that not many people see as a profession is, is challenging. But I have a, a innate belief that, that anything is possible when we put our hearts and minds and, and work hard. Now, you've recently published a memoir uh, titled Into the Planet. Tell us more. What is what is the takeaway here for, for readers? Well, Into the Planet covers uh, my life as an underwater explorer and some of the incredible things I've seen from inside Antarctic icebergs to underneath the Sahara Desert. But really, the, the, the book is more about you know, facing and embracing fear and big challenges in life. And, and uh, so maybe there's a little bit of self-help in there, but I think, uh, I think uh, people will be moved um, with a bit of inspiration from, from the lessons I've taken from my adventures around the world. As you've talked about, you know, the underwater world is full of wonders and mysteries, but its ecosystems and species are, are vulnerable to climate change uh, and human mm -hmm. impact. I am curious, have you noticed these changes over the over the while, you know, while cave diving? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, in my life, I'm in my late 50s, I shouldn't have seen so much change in the natural world and in our waterways as what I've seen in my lifetime. So I've seen everything from, you know, coral bleaching in the oceans to to springs that no longer flow um, because of the, the loss of volume in the aquifer um, to, you know, degradation of water bodies. In the Great Lakes, I was able to dive the lakes before zebra mussels covered all of the wrecks, um, but an invasive zebra mussel came in from the Caspian Sea and um, has really changed the entire biology of the lakes. But this region that I'm working in where the caves are in the Ottawa River are, are still free of zebra mussels. So we're very careful not to accidentally transport them there, um, but it is a little bit of an incubator place that allows us to see what the lakes were and what they could be again if we can control the invasive species. I'm curious to know, you know, not everyone is going to maybe suit up and, and start going cave diving uh, may not be for them, but a combination of citizen science and, and sort of underwater research. I'm curious, how can that be part of the solution to addressing those challenges? Oh, there are ways for everybody to get involved in protecting their, their local waterways as citizen scientists, you know, helping in water sampling activities or other things, but even just cleaning up their local bo water body and getting connected in that manner. So um, I think citizen science and outreach is an incredibly important part of solving very pressing issues. I mean, when we think about academia, we don't necessarily have the time on our side to go through some of these traditional research publication and peer review efforts when when we've got water and climate change issues that are like very, very dire. So citizen scientists can help us speed up that process and create a body of research and you know eyes on the water that can uh, that can help. Jill, really fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just a reminder that part two and three of the documentary series, Great Lakes Untamed, airs immediately after this program or stream at any time at tvo.org slash documentaries. Fifty years ago, the health of the Great Lakes was in such distress that it prompted the seminal bilateral Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between Canada and the United States. Douglas Hallett is a former chief scientist at Environment Canada and a UN silver medalist for advocacy for environmental stewardship. He spent the last half century studying pollution in the Great Lakes, and Douglas Hallett joins us now. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. All right. So, you know, this year, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement turns 50. Yes, sir. Signed 1972. In 1978, you authored amendments to that same agreement, broadening the approaches to how to address many sources of toxins in there. And your focus was on the dirty dozen, uh, the dirty dozen toxic chemicals. What were those dirty dozen? Uh, it started with DDT and DD DDE and PCBs and 
mercury and uh, sort of things that were quite well known. By that time, I had discovered there were 382 chemicals in the uh, gulls and fish that I was looking at, but I realized they they came from all the same sources that this you know the these the really big ones that we knew a little bit more about. These were very early days for mm -hmm. these chemicals that we knew a little bit about, and uh, that they were toxic, that they were persistent, and that they bioaccumulated uh, up the food chain. So. Um, I was working with the U.S. EPA. I was then on international committees. And my colleague, um, one of my best friends, my colleague, Waylon Swain, who's passed on, but he was an inspiration to me. And there were other people writing the Toxic Substances Control Act in the U.S. We had written the Environmental Contaminants Act in Canada. It was promulgated in 1978. And so in writing that, I, he and I coined this phrase, the dirty dozen. And we sort of did an analysis and we realized that if you get rid of these dirty dozen, you're gonna get rid of the other 384. So let's just focus on what people know about and get that done. That's where the dirty dozen came from. Most importantly, I was the discoverer of dioxin in the Great Lakes. Right. And, uh, that was one of the dirty dozen as well. You do mention uh, in, in some of your writing forever chemicals, and I want to uh, get an understanding of what forever chemicals are. People may assume that you know once chemicals are dumped in there, at some point they're being flushed out or they're going somewhere, but they stay in the water for quite a while. What, what, what do we mean by forever well, chemicals? Forever chemicals is a new phrase, and it's kind of a don't disturb the public phrase, mm. forever chemicals. Um, and it sounds like something you'd say to your girlfriend. But anyway, uh, the, uh, these chemicals, the new ones, are not chlorinated like PCBs or DDT or di chlorinated dioxins. They're fluorinated and brominated. <laughs> and, but fluorine, bromine, and chlorine are three, what are called halogens, that are joined on to organic molecules that are made up, they're hydrocarbons, um, that are made up of hydrogen and carbon. And then there's a chlorine bound here, and a, or a, now it's fluorine. And these are uh, refrigerants. There's, there's a role for these in our society. We need refrigerants. Right. We need dielectric fluids like PCBs. Uh, we need brominated fire retardants so that children's clothes don't catch on fire um, as examples. So that's what these forever chemicals are. And since I left government service in 1986 and having done all that work on the getting toxic substances into an international agreement, and working on these other pieces of legislation, it's appalling to see that there's a whole class of new chemicals that are called forever chemicals that have been created that are out there in Lake Ontario today and all of the Great Lakes accumulating up the ecosystem from the water to the plankton to the uh, to the fish, to the gulls, to the people. And I emphasize that. We are all part of this ecosystem. People are. I want to pick up on that. Uh, you know, you yourself have called yourself a scientist turned environmentalist. You've been advocating for the health of the Great Lakes and their adjacent communities for over five decades. Have When we look at sort of uh, the role that Canada and Ontario specifically have to play, have they been complacent on that front? Uh, it's, it's important to realize that you can clean these things up, that it doesn't have to be the way it is. And as I said, I'm appalled that a whole class of chemicals have been created since I left government service. They've been created and are out there contaminating the environment and they bioaccumulated in, and they are in 
everyone's body that lives around here. It's not just gulls and fish and bugs and bunnies that we're talking about. We're talking about us. And that, that happened again. And it's wrong. It, does, it didn't have to be that way. And we've got to be more vigilant and stay with the program. Is it, is it fair to say that there has been some progress made in eliminating some toxins oh, over the last few yeah, decades? I, 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 I'm not here as a politician. I'm here to state what it is. And there has been progress made. And it's because people know about it. It's because industry knows about it. I destroyed all the PCBs that General Motors Canada had hmm. in the, in, in, in the uh, late 1990s. They were proud to do that. Um, but uh, so, and, and you know, I employed Canadian people doing that. And GM was glad they got rid of this stuff. Others need to do the same. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's why I'm involved now in, in, as, as a businessman. Um, because I realize that you can make all the policy you like, but if you can make money <laughs> at this, it will prevail that people will continue to do this. And I believe that will happen with the right guidance from government on the Great Lakes. I want to talk about public opinion. Uh, your work about the dangers of living with chemicals was controversial in the 70s, 80s, so much so that you've you know sure. you left your post. When it comes to chemicals in our water and food, how do you think popular public opinion differs now from when it was back then? They don't know anymore. <laughs> they just, they, the fault, information isn't is out there. Okay to them. It is not presented. I hope this program becomes the beginning of doing it again, because it's so important. Um, uh, people, people's view of scientists with COVID has gone downhill. And uh, that the science behind COVID and getting those, um, dealing with it the way it was done scientifically, has what saved the world. And we need to realize we need to save ourselves from these forever chemicals. We can't have more of them. Or they just need to be managed better. It's like plastic. We've got plastic here, there. If you walk in your drugstore, everything is plastic. Hmm. It's very important to our society, but it just needs to be managed better. And there needs to be guidance. There needs to be, people need to believe the scientists about this. It's not just to say plastic's bad. It's to say plastic can be made into this. Plastic can be made into that and reused and recycled. And we need to have every chemical. So there's a cyclic nature to that chemical that people see it being made. They see it being used. And ultimately, they see it being remade back to probably what it was in the first place. And then the cycle begins again. Everything has to have a cycle to it. We've missed that part with plastic, particularly. You know, there has been a lot of progress when we look back from 50 years ago to now in terms of the Great Lakes. And I just I'm curious how can we reverse some of the damage we've done to these lakes or what work? needs to continue in order to get it to a level where, you know, we're, we're not too concerned. This is, it's important for people that live here to realize they are part of this ecosystem. Lake Ontario, near Toronto here, or which Toronto was part of, has a half time of the water in it of seven years. So when you put something in there, right. it doesn't flush down the toilet. It's there for a half time of seven years. And people say, well, won't it sink to the bottom? A limnologist or someone that studies lakes knows in this area of the world 
that there is a turnover every spring and every fall of the water where the water at the top gets heavier than the water at the bottom and the water turns the bottom water comes up to the top and the top water goes to the bottom just because of the temperature now Lake Erie has a very short half time it's only two years right. but Lake Huron and particularly Lake Se Superior Lake Superior has a half time of 70 years so that's the other part of this forever chemical stuff that's so important for people to say, you put a forever chemical in there, it'll be in there for the next couple of centuries. And we can't do that. Doug, that's all the time we have, but I really appreciate uh, you giving us some really insightful stuff in your time as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. Tomorrow, we continue our partnership with the Council of the Great Lakes Region during the Great Lakes Public Forum underway in Niagara Falls by examining how climate change makes this vital watershed even more indispensable. And 50 years to the day that Canada won the 1972 Summit Series, Hall of Famer Ken Dryden will be with us to recollect those events as only he can. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO. For joining us online at TVO.org, we'll see you again tomorrow. Now, stay tuned for the world premiere of parts two and three of the TVO original documentary series, Great Lakes Untamed, starting right now.